Hello, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Nicola Kemp and I'm Editorial Director of Creative Free. And it's my huge pleasure to host this incredible panel of women today who are fresh from judging the Garrity Awards 2021. The Garrity Awards are really special because they redefine the standards to which advertising is held. Named after Frances Garrity, the copywriter who coined the slogan, a diamond is forever, the awards mark the first time that juries have been brought together to select the very best in advertising, all advertising, not just advertising for women through the female lens. So women make up 80% of all purchasing decisions globally, yet historically advertising has been dominated by the male lens, both in front of and behind the camera, as well as in the makeup of juries. So coming out of a year like no other, the importance of broadening this lens has never been more apparent. So with this in mind, I'm delighted to be joined um, by this phenomenal panel of women who are gonna talk about some work. And, and it, it's important to recognize this work was often produced in the most challenges um, of circumstances, you know, emotionally, economically, technologically, um, so I'm super lucky today um, because with me, I have Ada Paris, who is a futurist, a cultural strategist, a systems designer and artist. I've got Fiora Johanna Storr. She is chief design officer at HUGE. Katie Jackson, who is managing director at TBWA London. Elizabeth Fallu, who is global creative league at Facebook. And Stacey June Shelton, who is global head of education and advocacy at the Dove Self-Esteem Project. Thank you all so much for joining me. So to kick off, um, and I know you were all judging yesterday, so it'd be amazing to just talk about the judging process um, because it has been such a tough year. Um, coming out of that judging process, um, what's been the key learning for you? And Ada, if I could kick off with you, please. <laughs> um, Thank you. It's, it's a real honour and privilege to be here. And I think the biggest takeaway from the judging process for me is remembering that we've all been in lockdown for everything that's going on. And so the first lens through which we look at the creative work is our own personal emotions. And then we have to take a second look to really judge the work and look at the work in relation to what's happening in the world and what, you know, what the intention of the advertising campaigns has been. That's great, thank you. And Fura, what was your key um, learning from the judging process? Because Ada really mentioned that sort of personal, emotional um, connection. And we're all, we're all sort of coming to this talk from different parts of, of the country um, today. It'd be great to get your view. Yeah, I think um, for me, it's what's interesting kind of with that in mind in a cultural context is that I feel like when you look at the work, some of the work kind of reflects the lack of representation within our industries. Um, so it's kind of, some of it is very authentic and real, but a big part of it doesn't hit that mark. So you're, you start thinking about like, do we have to rethink how we recruit and staff and how we bring people in because we need to do that to stay relevant. and and. You know, a lot of great work, but it's also like a lot of work that's just not really hitting it. So that's kind of my big learning because that really helps me figure out what I need to do better as a leader uh, within the walls of Hughes. That's a really good point. And I think especially in the post-pandemic world, this whole drive to build back better can really be rooted in, in, in kind of seeing where the, the gaps are. And Stacey, I'd love to get your view of the judging process. I mean, what was the key learning for you? Yeah, I, this is the first judging opportunity I've had. So um, very exciting to be part of this process with um, a wonderful group of individuals. But I, yeah, I felt authenticity. I mean, I would always push for a lot more. Um, I would love for authentic voices always and move away from actors and celebrities. But um, I thought there was still quite a lot of use of authenticity, um, people sharing their own experiences um, in their voices. There actually weren't that many um, celebs used in a lot of ads. Um, so yeah, I, I thought authenticity, but let's, let's get a lot more. Um, but it seems to be a trend coming out that brands are wanting um, to use a real authentic voice. 
Thank you so much, Stacey. And that's so good to hear because I think we've been talking about authenticity and marketing for about a decade, <laughs> but it still sometimes okay. feels like the idea of a real woman in an ad is like, oh, that's the idea. So it's really great to see that become so mainstream. And, and Katie, I'd love to get your view as well on the judging as to what your what your key learning was. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I completely concur around the authenticity and credibility point, but I think what's been really brilliant to see is how much we are starting to witness tech being used for good. You know, not just tech being used for tech's sake, but brands employing tech in a way that's really going to drive long-term change. And I think we'll come on to talk about that a bit later in, in terms of moving into activism spaces and how credibly brands could do that. But I was just so excited and blown away to see a lot of great examples of technology and innovation being employed for good. So I, I found that really, really great. It's, it's really good to see. And I think it's one of the really positive um, shifts that the pandemic has has brought with it you know this mm. kind of shift to different ways of working more possibilities through technology and there was such a huge diversity of work in the awards this year um, the thing I always love about the Garrity Awards is even though I spend all year looking at creative work there's always creative work that I haven't seen and and it's always just that broadening of that that lens and there was also a real amount of joy in the work, which we think back on 2020, it was it was such a tough year and there was still um, those moments um, that came through. So, um, Elizabeth, I'd love to get your view. I mean, what was your view on just the creative diversity of, of the work? Were there were there moments of brilliance that that really kind of made you think differently or inspired you? Well, I have to say that, um, you know, the, the pandemic has been really interesting in a couple of ways. Um, interesting is a good word. But I, I think that one of the big themes that we're seeing across all of our businesses and clients and people who work on our platforms is that the power shift has been palpable and it's been global actually for the first time. We've seen the power being shifted to the consumer over the probably the last decade in a tremendously dramatic way. But I think that because of the some of the, the social justice movements that happened at, on top of the pandemic, you know, um, there's an allergy that's been developed to brands being tone deaf to the values and needs of the consumer. It's it's no longer appropriate. And um, and I think that that's really joyous, you know, and it's funny because you start to see brands start, to, you know, try to figure out what their values are. And there was some fumbles, you know, um, I feel like their hearts were in the right place, but it's really difficult for a brand that might be selling a soft drink to be like, what do I stand for and how do I back it up? But the fact that that's really being demanded um, and, you know, really, um, uh, appreciated by the modern consumer, uh, you know, we uh, is I think I think that to me is is probably the most joyous piece. And even sometimes when I was kind of like, ah, I'm not really sure if they hit that like right on the head. I'm like, you're you're moving in the right direction. You need to do some more talking to people. You need to listen a bit more um, and bring that authenticity into your space. Uh, but the fact that it seems to be ubiquitously a priority right now is pretty exciting. Yeah, that's so interesting in terms of that sort of power shift. And I love your your um, sentiment, you know, especially with work that came out in 2020 of the, the kind of trying, the act of trying in itself should be celebrated, even if it doesn't exactly get there, at least you're, you're, you're moving in the right direction. We just have less <laughs> piano music, though. I mean... <laughs> I feel like at this point, the best of the best spots were like spoofing the piano music, kind of <laughs> modern voiceover. That's just a personal taste thing. No, but. That's definitely a really interesting <laughs> conversation, isn't there, around the kind of style of advertising that came out in 2020. And I think there was a, an element of fear around it to some degree of not, you know, offending people of having quite a sort of piano led tone, perhaps. <laughs> and Ada, I'd love to bring you in here. I mean, what, what was your view looking at that creative work and building on some of Elizabeth's point of that, that amazing shift that we're seeing? Um, and we're gonna talk about it a bit more in terms of activism, but in terms of the creative diversity of the work, what were the key trends for you? Um, you know, picking up on what everybody has said and Elizabeth has said, there is, there's 
there is a real desire for authenticity, but I think that people were nervous and it comes through in some of the work that they wanted to do the right thing, but actually there's a clumsiness that came through for some of it. And it's really that for me, and I think for actually when we were having the judging ses session yesterday, really demonstrates that we need a wider diversity in the create, in not, not just in the creation of the work, but in the judging, in the sign off of some of the pieces of work. There definitely needs to have more diversity. It can't just be the same people, the same channels. We are in a world now that doesn't look anything like it did before. Our conversations, the way that we interact with each other, we're recognizing the human more and more. I mean, all of us now are seeing into each other's homes and we're seeing the human in each other. And we need to maintain that, you know, when we go back into the offices and when we're doing work. And I think that what we need to do is really think about how, who needs to be involved in the conversation at the start and not just at the end, not just at the judging panel session. It's right at the very beginning when the idea is formed, there needs to be more people, a flatter structure of having that diversity there because that will start to come through in the world. You can see people trying, you can see some of it coming through, you know, for some of the um, campaigns that I saw, I had this initial moment of, oh my gosh, there's this in this work and then go, oh, but it's so clumsily done. Mm -hmm. And it's that you know, and who signed that off? And it's but so there's that conflict with all of us in the in that whole work. And I think that is diversity. For me, diversity is it should be systemic. It shouldn't be one person's role. We shouldn't just have a chief diversity officer. I think that what we need to do is make sure we have flatter structures in that creation piece. And mm. I think you can start to see little bits of that coming through. And it, it's people need to be braver in just going, I don't know. Help. Yeah, I think I don't know. It's always the three most underused words in in business and in life. Um, but I think, but that's sorry, but I think that that's what we've learned through this. All of us have learned through this pandemic that there mm -hmm. is strength in vulnerability, and I mm -hmm. think it's the same for business. And businesses need to really stand up and say, businesses and business leaders need to stand up and say, I don't know, help, because people are out there willing to help, especially now. That's such a good point. And, and Stacey, I'd love to bring you in here because that vulnerability element, um, particularly from a brand leadership perspective, can really deliver the best work. Um, I'd, I'd love to get a view on you from you on, on the creativity of the work that you saw in the awards this year and, and, and your thoughts really on, on how we progress things further because there does seem to be a trend here of there were some beautiful ideas that perhaps didn't um, didn't reach their full potential. Um, so yeah, I'd love to get your view on that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think what um, the other panelists have mentioned too, just the intention. So the intention may be there, but are they executing it um, with the same, yeah, authenticity? We're gonna start to overuse that word, but yeah, you know, working behind the lens, um, not just putting people in front of the lens, but uh, involving them in the creative process, working with experts, I think, from communities, if you can, is really important. It doesn't take much. It's just building it into your kind of timeline and work plan and people from those communities um, you want to include can just help make sure that uh, the messages are right. Because when you start to be more authentic um, and you're trying to, you then get held to a kind of, a, you get put on a pedestal um, and judged too, so you, you need to be extra careful um, what, what you're putting out there and what you're saying. And if you want to go in and talk about, you know, very um, sensitive topics, you know, make sure you're, you're doing the homework to, to get it right. I think too, keeping it authentic to your brand is important. So I think it looks really, it can look fake. People have, again, very good intentions, um, but when I've spoken to people on other brands um, in our own business and they wanna know how to do purposeful communications and brand dues and actions, really it needs to be close, to, it needs to have a social purpose and there needs to be a social need. So don't just create mm. something out of thin air that you think is important, but it needs to be linked to your brand in some way and, and what your mission and vision is. Um, or it, it also doesn't come across, it's not just the voices, are they authentic, but is what you're doing as a brand authentic too, I think is 
important that, again, some brands tried and brought up some really important issues, but maybe it wasn't as authentic to their brand as it could have been. So just re-looking at that a bit more. That's such an interesting point. And, and I'm really pleased that you mentioned that the power of community as well and the role of kind of engaging those those communities that you're seeking to connect with, with authenticity. We'll definitely um, come back to that. And, and Katie, I'd love to bring you in here because it's not always easy to get out the best work um, into the world. You know, there's often ideas are diluted on the journey. Um, what was your takeaway in terms of the type of creative work that you saw and, and, and what, what trends you saw within that? I think firstly, I, I love what Ada said earlier about uh, diversity being everyone's responsibility in the room. Don't expect to just mm -hmm. make it one person's role and job. So I think actually that helps answer your question in some way, right? Which is mm -hmm. make sure you have a bunch of people around the table who are all aware of the job that they are there to do and who take collective accountability for the work that's going out there. It's not just the creative director's job. It's not just the strategist's job. It's not just the account person's job to get the client on board with it. It's everybody's responsibility to question and challenge at every turn. And I think I'm going to talk about a specific piece of work for a second because we all, I think, really enjoyed discussing the value of the Cycle by Frida product and pack design entry, right? Am I seeing lots of nodding? Yes, please. So, so Cycle by Frida, you know, firstly, I thought using product and pack design to communicate a message is really where you should always start rather than focusing on a kind of big piece of film or whatever. But but what's fascinating about what that brand is doing is they are challenging stereotype. They're saying, hey, there's a there's a problem around period inclusivity. It's not for women, it's for humans. You know, we used that word earlier as well. We're, we're starting to level the playing field around focusing on human challenges and human causes and human barriers rather than gender or class or race or religion. And so I think, you know, when you find brands like the Cycle by, by Frida work who are doing brilliant, brilliant things to affect that real change, that's really exciting. That wasn't one person's idea, right? That's going to be a bunch of people rallying around the table to end up in a place where they can be really proud of what they've created. So I would say make sure, you know, you've got to make sure that everybody around the table is taking accountability, but also focus on human rather than any other subcategory, I think. I love that insight of, of diversity being everyone's responsibility as well. And Ada touched on it too, just that idea of moving from a, a kind of me focused industry to a we focused industry is such a powerful tool in, in building back better. And Fura, I'd love to bring you in here because it, it was touched on um, already, but in such a challenging year, um, the importance of brands really tangibly supporting local communities, of mm -hmm. reaching out to those communities, reflecting them in the work. I mean, did you see that reflected in the work this year in terms of that shift? You know, we've always talked about global brands versus local brands, but really this kind of move to more community focused work, is, is that something you saw within the entries? I think you can see it in pockets where it's actually kind of attacking um, a very specific locations or trying to solve a very specific problem. But I, I don't know if it was done at scale. Um, I do think though, like going back to this idea of diversity, because I think there are different ways of looking at it and different mindsets. And I think what the best pieces of work that we saw perspective, which is why it was so good, but also diversity of capabilities, you know, kind of starting to work differently as teams like Katie gets into and, and like, you know, thinking about, you know, we have technologists here, we have hackers on this call, right? It's very important to bring those people into the dialogue really early on. So really change the way we work to make sure that the output is great, bringing everybody along on the journey. And I totally agree. I think everybody on the team has a license to speak up. And it's so important today to hear all of those voices, both local voices, people from different backgrounds, um, and just making sure that we're hitting the mark. And I think, you know, 
because we did talk about some of the work yesterday and some of it was so off. We we're like, who signed this off? Because it's like, it feels like someone signed it off. It's like, it doesn't feel like it was kind of a collaborative thing. It felt like it was someone at the top who was like, made this decision. Um, while other work just feels more dynamic in a way. And it feels like there's a lot of different people with different types of inputs and ideas that actually made it happen. And that's when it becomes authentic, you know, you can feel it. But I don't think there's a lot of work there that I would say was local. I would say it was in pockets, but mm -hmm. I think it's just more uh, the different points of view that came in to make the best work great. It's really interesting to hear. And I love the way that you use the word collaboration because that feels to me like such a, a thing that we've grappled with in 2020. You know, how do we collaborate better? How do we collaborate um, remotely? And, and Stacey, I'd, I'd love to get your view on this, um, particularly um, the work to be done with collaborating with communities and, and reflecting those communities really authentically in the work, because that feels like something that isn't necessarily coming through in the work. I mean, what, what's, what's your view on that, on how the industry progresses more when it comes to being more collaborative and, and, and creative, but really authentically representing the communities it's seeking to connect with? Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and it's not always, maybe you don't have to hire them. They don't have to be on your staff if that doesn't work. It's about, like I said before, you know, working with experts working you know bringing in people um as Ade said like bringing in people and working on the creative process at different points um whenever that's that's the right moment so yeah you you may not always be able to have the head count or bring them in to be on your staff um but find those right moments to talk to the community i think in like i know when we do casting, you know, having understanding people's story, it's not just about what they look like. Do they fit this uh, kind of description of who you want, but what's their story? Does, does as a whole person, you know, do, um, and I think that brings out, again, the authenticity of, of what, and it comes through to consumers um, as well. So in front of the camera, behind the camera, find those moments to um, consult with experts um, and talk to people in the community. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot better representation from people of different communities. I'm, I'm, I saw in the work there could be more, um, mm -hmm. and I don't think even our brands probably do enough of it. So I know a lot of the work is still very able-bodied, um, and you may have like different body sizes and um shades and colors but we still could do a lot more on like physical disfigurement so there's still lots of work yeah to be done <laughs> but i mean it's it's good to hear because it is a it's a journey isn't it and it's also factoring in that time um within the creative process for that consultation with those communities and being really um aware of who isn't in the room or you know, you've all, or a few of you have mentioned sort of who's signing off some of this work, you know, having a, being really um, aware of that. Um, and also with the, the shift that we've been seeing um, that, that's been touched on, a um, very sort of personal shift um, around um, brand activism. Um, we've seen some really hard hitting messages um, delivered with real creative flair um, and delivered at a time when personally and, and professionally people were, were cre facing really, and I know it's such an overused word, but it is a, a, a true word, unprecedented challenges. And, and Ada, I'd love to get your view. How do you think this activism is, is having an impact on the work that, that you're seeing? I think, first of all, we have to really be clear about what we, what we mean by activism. Um, activism isn't just going on protest marches and, you know, putting up a black flag on your Instagram profile to say that we are, don't support anti-racism. Where organisations, if they are going to go down that route, that they need to make sure that they've got their house in order as well, because it's so easy now for people to unpick all of that. To me, activism is believing in something bigger than yourself and know, having an idea of what good or great feels like, not just what it looks like, 
is what it feels like. What are the values, the morals, the ethics underneath that? Recognizing your own levels of power, privilege and responsibility and how you can use that to help amplify the voices, the stories, the lived experiences of others and don't make them stereotypes. So, you know, adding on to what Stacey was saying about involving the community. Yes, involve different communities, but then don't turn them into stereotypes of we're only going to, you know, we are going to use, we're going to embrace this community, but then we're going to create an advertising campaign that makes that person a, a figurehead of our impression of what that means. Actually, you know, um, and so, and then also activism is about really rallying the, the voices of others, finding the others who believe in the similar things as you do and recognizing that what you have in your head may not be the final answer. It's about being flexible, being organic and recognizing that it's a learning journey. And so brands are starting to do a bit of that. And we see some of that. There are a few of the campaigns that made me cry, but, but I think why they made me cry is because I went, finally, finally somebody has mentioned it, but then going, okay, there's still a little, there's still a bit more but I think that we are definitely in a time where more and more people are talking about activism and wanting to do it. But I think that what needs to happen first is there needs to be some introspection and looking at yourself and recognizing that there's a gap that what seems to happen sometimes is that there's a gap about we're putting this out brand out here, we're putting this campaign out here, this is what we're saying, but internally we haven't sorted out our own stuff. And that is where it becomes, that's where the inauthenticity comes in because it's so easy now for consumers, as we talked about earlier, to unpick that and say, well, you've put, you know, we're in Pride Month. So it's really easy for brands to go put rainbows on everything or to do a hashtag Pride or what have you. But internally, there, there is a gap in terms of diversity, in terms of accountability, in terms of, you know, salaries, promotion, all of those things. If you're going to say that you're doing activism, then you need to do all of it. You can't just cherry pick the bits that look nice for you or the bits that are going to make you money. And that's the that's where people really need to understand that it, that's what we're starting to see coming through the campaigns. That's such a powerful point. And, and, and that sort of focus on amplification of others in activism and, and those proof points um, is, is so powerful. And, and Katie, I'd, I'd love to bring you in here because it, it has been a, a time where people have been expressing themselves and, and we're going to move on to technology. And technology has been such an empowerer of just getting far more voices out into the world, um, amplifying a much greater diversity of voices and providing huge platforms for, for creative self-expression. Um, what, what's your view of, of, of where brand activism is going because we've got so many issues um, to, to solve um, as an industry and we've we've always tended to go towards peak purpose or greenwashing before we've really kind of got to grips with the real potential of the creative industries to change behavior and challenge culture. Um, what, what's your view Katie on, on, on where we where we are with brand activism? Um, I think brands need to proceed with caution. Um, I think there is, I think there's a sliding scale. Um, and again, Ada's just touched on it, right? There's a difference between activism and allyship and all the way on the left-hand side, exclusion. And I think that brands need to think really carefully about why they exist and often you know, I think brands need to ask themselves this really simple question more and more, which is why? <laughs> why, what, why are we doing this, right? And, and hey, it turns out that what we were all taught in school still stands. Ask why five times and you might get to the root of the issue. Often you will find that if you ask that question five times, there is no answer. And I think that that is reflected in the quality of the output and in the quality of the work. And it is going to be today's buzzword, isn't it? The, the authenticity point is coming back in again here, but you've got to start with why. And I think brands that have activism baked into their DNA from when they started can legitimately go out there and rally consumers around their mission because that's why they exist. That's you know credibly why they are 
um, why they are in society today. Other brands, you know, if you haven't got a dog in that fight already, don't put one in last minute because you'll lose. So I, I think you've got to start with why. you just got to start mm. with why. That's such a kind of simple but powerful insight and something really um, powerful about the judging process as well, because you can step back from the work and and sometimes see that 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 kind of basic framework isn't there. And Elizabeth, I'd love to bring you in here um, because obviously we're on Zoom for this discussion, which is a, a wonderful example about how tech is bring, still bringing us all together. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously it's as well, it was touched on um, earlier in the discussion, just the diversity of technology, you know, that the empowerment that comes with technology. Um, and I just really wondered, what's your view? Because you really see um, all sides of the industry with this, because we've got this huge opportunity to be more flexible, to bring in more talent from all over the world. Um, did you see that impact of technology in the work and where do you see that progressing further? Um, you know, I have to say candidly that I was a bit surprised by some of the case studies that I saw because um, I felt like they might not have been taking advantage of the, the, the wealth of, here we go, authenticity that we have uh, available to us. Um, and, and, you know, I'm in an unusual situation, right? So I'm a, a, a creative lead social media technology platform. We work with brands, but we also work with creators. And the only reason why we exist, the why is to bring people together to foster community um, and to amplify individual voices. And so I think that in terms of the tech that I saw, um, I wish I had seen a little bit more leaning into the, that those riches that exist for us. And, you know, um, a bit to your point, uh, Katie, you know what, we talk a lot with our clients about two things. One is showing up bearing gifts, right? Because ultimately, I mean, I have 8 billion bosses, right? <laughs> like everybody who's on our platform is, is, is my boss. And, 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 you know, if we're going to create things or encourage brands to be active on our platforms, we ask them to think about showing up bearing gifts, coming to say thank you to the real change makers who are out there, um, you know, championing causes and being, being, uh, you know, authentic, but then um, also to do more listening, right? And that's just echoing what you're saying a bit more. But the thing is, is you know, and we, and Stacy and I have worked together, you know, um, you know, sort of trying to to figure out how to fold social media into the amazing work that she does with with young women and girls. And um, and it, the thing is, is that when you start to listen, you don't end up usually with a really clear strategy. Right. And brands like to be reductive. They want to have a tagline. They want to have like, this is our guiding light. This is our target. Right. But people are messy. <laughs> right. That's why they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when you stop and start to listen and give the, the mic back to them, it's a little bit of a risk. Right. Because you, you, you have to actually, you know, uh, be, tr be, be true to them. So I would love to see next year more tech examples that have leaned into, into the community, done more listening, and then showed up bearing gifts. And the, the cycle example, I think, is perfect. They listened, they saw an unmet need, they listened to it, a very authentic voice, and they came up with a solution and a gift. Um, so uh, more of that, please. <laughs> That's such a, a powerful insight. And I mean, the messiness is exactly what I was thinking about, you know, it is it's it's that's where the authenticity lies perhaps is in the contradictions and the you know the the sort of quite far away from the kind of stereotypes of consumers that we we've, we've seen in the past um we've had such a whistle stop tour of the trends um in the work that we've seen and i think the power of the garrity awards is to really shift that lens through which advertising is viewed um but there's no question that the pandemic has had a really negative impact on women, on people of color. Um, so doubling down on really um, broadening that lens is really important. And as we look to build that better in the wake of the pandemic, I just love you um, all to just be able to leave the audience with, with one tip or piece of advice to keep on broadening that lens because it's not always easy, right? We're always prioritizing the seemingly urgent um, and that the important obviously sometimes gets um, overlooked. So Fura, I'd love to get your view on that. What, what takeaway would you give to the audience on how to keep on broadening that creative lens? 
I think, you know, listening, I think some people here have really said that, like, let's listen, let's kind of focus on the insights. But I think we need to stop trying to <laughs> overanalyze things and we need to bring people in. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel like we're in an industry where I, I, I'm getting a little bit cynical about, about things like service design, because we have very smart strategists who are maybe middle-aged trying to understand a generation that we're not hiring, hiring into the industry. So for me, like, let's listen more, let's hire more diverse talent, and let's ask this question, why? You know, and really go back to the brand purpose and make sure that they have a license to play. Um, and, and help them navigate it. It's super complicated out there, you know? Brands are navigating the most complicated landscape they've ever seen, both politically, techno from a technology, te technology standpoint and from an opportunity standpoint. So like, you know, it's, it's difficult, but yeah, listen and, and focus. That's great advice and getting that sort of the simple things right, like the why, make the complicated things more accessible to solve, hopefully. And, and yes. Katie, what would be um, your takeaway as to kind of how the industry and the people within it can keep broadening the lens? Um, I think there's two things. I think um, picking up on what Firas just said, the, the next generation couldn't give two monkeys about advertising. And I understand that. And I think we need to find a way to change that by reaching into those younger audiences and generations and engaging them in conversations so that we learn more, but also so that maybe we can have a, a, a legitimate dialogue with them about why we're doing what we're doing and try and encourage more young people into the industry. Um, so, so I really, I encourage all brands and businesses to try and get into an outreach program with you know young people in their communities. I, I don't think enough businesses are doing it. And the second thing I think is really simple. Um, and actually, I, I learned from Karen Blackett um, on a on a <laughs> on a recent uh, panel with her, which was look around the room and if everybody looks like you and talks like you, start again. <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of that simple. <laughs> Those are great takeaways, thank you. And Ada, could I ask you the same question? What advice would you give um, to, to the audience as to how to better broaden that lens? I would ask them the same question that I do with all of my work is what kind of ancestor do you want to be? You know, what's the longevity of the work that you're doing? It's not about this short term, making a quick buck or making market share or anything like that. The work that we're putting out into the world will have an impact and there will be a ripple effect and we need to really consider what the longevity of that how is it going to impact future generations and that's tied like all of that is wrapped up in what are our values and our moral philosophy you know what are who are we bringing to the table to be a part of that conversation and that involves what are our governance structures because if our governance structures are perpetuating the same thing and the same behaviors and the same work then something's wrong and you know so it's the creative the creative work will come into that the you know all of the different things that we're doing and so the question is just what kind of ancestor do you want to be that's a, a brilliant um takeaway and i love the idea of the ripple effects as, as well and stacy could i bring you in here and um, what, what would you give as advice to the audience as to how to kind of keep broadening that lens yeah i think one of the themes I've spoke on the whole time and for uh, uh, mentioned it too around listening, I think going back to the fundamentals of marketing, we are not our consumer. Even if I have the same identity, I'm an American white woman, you know, I'm going to have a different perspective. And you, we do that, I think brands do that on product a lot, but they haven't, maybe they haven't done that very well on purposeful communications. And when they want to be activists, they're not you know, listening to those communities. So don't just listen to your consumer uh, for the product development piece, but listen to it throughout the creative, pro listen to them throughout the creative process. Thank you so much. And, and last but not least, Elizabeth, I'd love to get your takeaways. Um, you know, we've had some great um, comments around active listening, um, the ripple effects and really the importance of authenticity. I mean, what would be your advice um, to the audience as to how they keep that lens really broad? Use your power to build for people. 
every single day we are blown away by the incredible power of the individual on our platforms, right? How much change a single person can make. If you think about that in the context of a brand some, and a global brand sometimes, you know, how much privilege, how much power do you have to share? So build stages and give the mic away, you know, show up and get bear gifts, look at your own backyard, fix your internal problems before you start standing up for things publicly, take your commercial budgets and put it into hiring for diverse teams, you know, like, like use your power, you have so much, but use it to build for people. That's such a powerful point um, to end on. Um, thank you all for such um, an incredible discussion. There are so many things to take away from there um, and so many positive um, examples um, of brilliant work, but also brilliant ways to, to widen that lens. Um, a huge thank you to the Geraghty Awards um, for providing um, the inspiration for this conversation and the space um, to make it happen. And thank you all um, for tuning in. I hope you all use your power um, to build for people um, and take that opportunity to broaden the lens. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys are amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.